Okay, so so I guess I guess this is now the hands-on part. I mean, hands-on really not. Uh, we are not going to give you access to, to, to the to the test bed yet. Uh, if you happen to be it in Washington D.C. on the Merit workshop next week, you will be able to do hands-on, right? But the problem is that today are way too many people for hands-on, and and we sort of decided we'll do the the talking and and show and tell. <coughs> Okay, so I'll start first, as, as, as some of you have seen these slides probably 15 times, so you will excuse me for that, but you know, I have to do it for people who didn't see it. I'll do the brief overview of uh, Cosmos technologies and, and uh, features. Uh, then we'll do some uh, show and tell on the outreach, and then go into how you actually use the testbed, right? And then, of course, follow that with lots of demos. Um, hopefully interesting. So, Cosmos, it's planned deployment, it's West Harlem, it's area of about one square mile. Um, it starts at 120th, which is the edge of the Columbia, <coughs> main to Columbia campus, goes to about 135th Street, which is sort of the corner of City, uh, City University of New York, and then we have Broadway and Amsterdam on two sides of the area, and that's about a square mile. Um, the plan is to deploy nine large sites, and when I say large, that usually means rooftop with multiple sectors, and about 40 medium sites, which is really, in our speak, um, lamp post, sort of uh, giant shoebox type of uh, node. Um, we also plan to have, as, as we discussed, uh, about 200 what we call the near portable or small nodes. And these are essentially a little bit bigger than this box. Nooks, full-blown power P, uh, PCs with SDR attached to it. Uh, the reason why they're called near portable, you still need about two hands to carry it around. And of course, the idea is not to necessarily carry them around, but deploy them in some of the vehicles that we'll have in the vicinity of the testbed area, right? <clears throat> And of course, a lot of connectivity to the uh, rest of the world. Now, system architecture, right? So this doesn't really represent any communication layers, so don't read into that. It's really a layering of processing that's available. <clears throat> By the way, we do have a full-blown handheld software-defined radio, but the capability is really, really limited. In other words, it's an ARM-based platform, does have an FPGA, it does have an SDR, in front of that FPGA, meaning uh, A to D converters and RF uh, converters in front of it. But it's really not a very powerful device, so don't count on it running in, say, an LTE protocol stack or something similar. It, it's really meant more as a, as a source of signal that you can carry around and then uh, do the monitoring with the infrastructure. <clears throat> so user devices are somewhere at the bottom, and hopefully they will be all programmable as much as we can afford, right? Above that, you have these antennas that are either on the rooftops or sitting on the lampposts. They have their own SDRs, which means that they have the uh, capability of, of sampling the spectrum, as well as some local processing, which is literally next to the antenna, right? Then, nearby, there is a small cloud, right? So if you really think about this, we are talking about something that's sitting on the rooftop, it's not going to be a, a large uh, deployment of, of machines, but there will be a, a set of nodes that can be used for um, processing signal through. And then, of course, you have a, a layer that's sitting in the control centers, um, both in Columbia, uh, NYU, and Rutgers at various distances from the uh, actual antennas. Now, if you Look at the, some of the characteristics, right? So one of the features, as you heard, is optical layer, right? So there is a massive optical layer with switching, and I jokingly call it recoloring, but it's really a Rodams, which are another uh, type of DWDM switching. that interconnects all of this. It's really a star connectivity, which means that we have a fairly large optical switch sitting in Columbia, a data center with 320 ports, right? So we can, we can bring in 320 fibers into the core, 
and then do all sorts of cross connects, right? Next to that switch, we have a lot of rodents, which means we can combine these various signals into single stream that we can send in various places. That literally means that you can create really crazy topologies. And you will see in the optical demo, you will see some of that capability. But you can think of that as an underlay. So you don't necessarily need to see that in any other way, but as if you are stretching the fiber to various distances based on the topology that you set up. On top of that, we have the SDN layer, which is your typical, let's say, layer 2 or layer 3, uh, which means that at every location we have switching, programmable switching capability, right, in terms of whether it's Ethernet or IP uh, SDN based. Right? Then further up we have clouds in three locations, right, so Columbia, NYU, and Rutgers, and smaller clouds, mini clouds, and it's actually four machines, four fairly large beefy machines. They're ascending at nine rooftops. And then, of course, at the very end, next to the antennas, we have those SDRs with some processing capabilities. Right? So a lot of choices to be made. Where do you put your computing? Um, <clears throat> key technologies in SDR. We have in every node at least two Sub -six, what we call the sub-6 gigahertz SDRs. So um, we are talking about something that operates between 400 megahertz and 6 gigahertz. Um, that's the capability of the box itself. Of course, FCC would never let us play with all that range, right? So we had to put a few filters in there. So yes, you can in theory try to send a GPS signal out of it, but you know, uh, the filtering will hopefully prevent it. If filtering doesn't prevent it, you will hear it from us, okay? Because we are going to monitor and, and, and get you if you try to do stuff that's not, uh, not allowed, right? Now, as far as bands that are supported, I believe, and Jake will correct me if I'm wrong, we have 2.4 gigahertz, 2.6, 3, 7 to 4, 2, the entire 5 to 6 gigahertz band, right? So those are the bands that we filter through, right? So those are the ones that we pass through. When I say we allow 2.6 gigahertz, that doesn't really mean that you're allowed to do any frequency at 2.6. That's actually a very dangerous range because uh, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile have services in 2.6 gigahertz range. So you have to ask for special permission to use that band. Now, I said there are two SDRs. One is what we call the experimenter's SDR, which means you can do anything you want with it. Right? The second one is really for us to monitor what's going on. Now, due to some characteristics of these SDRs, we actually in the last moment decided that we will let experimenters use even our monitoring radio, but only on the, you have to justify why you need that radio as well. So, for the large node, you have essentially three boxes like this, which each has two SDRs, optical gear, oh, sorry, optical, uh, Ethernet switching gear, monitoring elements inside, and management for the box, connected to two by two directional antennas, right? And you will see later on when we talk about deployment where these current antennas are, how they are oriented. Uh, the medium node is essentially the same thing, except that it has single box, meaning only two SDRs and some Ethernet gear and optical gear inside, and omnidirectional antennas. Obviously, it doesn't make too much sense to put something on the, on the street level and, and try to orient it, because you know, where are you going to go? <clears throat> and it's again two by two, right? Both sets of boxes have, um, I want to say, 0.8 watt amplifiers, and it's some hand waving here because these are sloppy wideband amplifiers which are all over the place in terms of performance at particular frequencies. So let's say it's somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8 watts, right? Probably not. Yeah, maybe even one watt if you're lucky. But that's, that's what we have as capability. Of course, that means that when you're doing things 
let's say 2.4 gigahertz, in theory, you're not within the FCC specs, right? But, you know, hope is that people will be willing to tolerate that, at least for a while. <clears throat> millimeter wave, right? Right now, there is no millimeter wave that you can get your hands on at the moment. It's, it's, it's being worked on as we speak. So hopefully, before the end of the summer, there will be at least the sandbox deployment of millimeter wave. Um, at the moment, uh, we are talking about 28 year deployment, which is, of course, the most interesting one. And this is based on IBM, and actually, IBM and Ericsson, because they, they jointly did this project some time back. But it's IBM RA, which actually consists of four uh, integrated circuits, each with 16 antennas. So you have a 64 antenna uh, array, which can be used in one of the two modes. The first mode is fairly narrow beam, and you'll see the slide on the next, uh, next slide on the performance of a single beam. <coughs> or in eight beam configuration, which means that you can target, at least theoretically, simultaneously eight different clients, right? <coughs> now, we will start by attaching this to the USRP, to the SDRs, right? And, of course, that means that at least initially it will be limited to about 100 megahertz of band. Um, plan is to, over time, replace the USRPs uh, with the RF SOC based platform, which has much wider band capability. Problem with RF SOC is, of course, that we have to then program that thing from scratch, meaning there is very little out there that's readily available to be used for, for experimentation. Whereas USRPs, there is a plenty of stuff that people can use right away. <clears throat> as I said, uh, the area is, is fairly narrow beam width, as you can see. It's really a, a fairly, fairly nice package. Um, so initially, there will be only a few of them. Plan is that by the end of the year or early next year, we start deploying much larger number and essentially have every single location with the <clears throat> 20 gigahertz capability. We also have a plan and are in the process of deploying uh, 60 gigahertz solutions. And there will be more news coming out uh, Thursday about that. So 60 gigahertz stuff, uh, unfortunately, most of it is point to point or point to multipoint. There, there is going to be a while before we get an SDR uh, at 60 gigahertz that can do 2 gigahertz of bandwidth. That's, uh, that's a non-trivial exercise. Now, I mentioned medium node. <clears throat> the configuration that we actually deployed already in the pilot phase doesn't have the millimeter wave, so forget about this. It does have the uh, sub-6 gigahertz, as I said, two SDRs. Uh, it has the, as I said, 2 by 2 MIMO and antenna front end, which is actually switched and, and can, we can do some uh, sharing of the radio signals in between the two platforms as well as ability to use one or the other <coughs> or to experiment itself. That is connected to a local switch that's sitting in the, in the box, even for the medium node, but this is essentially the same thing as a sector of the large node. And there is a full-blown PC inside the box, right? So, you know, at least for the experimenters, the main radio, there is a PC. Actually, this one is not PC, it's, a, it's a, a ARM, as I said, which means that it's fairly limited uh, capability, uh, CPU capability. Point is that this all goes at least 10G to the core. So both of these are going over 10G interface back to the core. And of course, here we show it as a single switch, but it, in, in actuality, it might be multiple fibers taking each of these back to the core at 10G. <clears throat> um, optical networking, I'm not going to spend much time on this because this is, this is something that you'll hear more about later on, other than to say that we are trying to make this optical layer fully programmable, same way, and, and of course, give it to experimenters, right? So all the SDN switching, all the optical layer, is given to an experimenters to do experiments. With the caveat, the optical layer is a little bit tricky. So whoever wants to play with this will have to graduate first. <laughs> and the reason is fairly simple. This is very expensive equipment. And if you, 
if you screw up the power coming out of the rodam, you can fry whatever is on the other end, which literally means we have to throw away the equipment and buy a new one. So therefore, you will have to graduate if you want to use, uh, to play with the optical layer, okay? Um, looking at the bigger picture, as I said, the idea is really there is this massive switch from all the large nodes and, and medium nodes, you have between two and six fibers coming in. You have a bunch of rodents sitting on the back of that switch or front, whichever way you want to look at it. It's actually, there is no back and front of the switch, it's a switch. And you can then route signals all over the place. Each large node has a smaller optical switch and a number of rodents, right? Which then gives you ability to create really weird topologies. Not weird, arbitrary topologies, arguably. On top of that, we have SDN and cloud, right? So this is really every single server that we have in the, in the deployment um, is really a, a machine which has all three technologies. So there is an FPGA board. There is a GPU board. There is a multi-core CPU inside, right? So the GPUs are... Uh, V100s, the, the, the latest and greatest and we developed. Maybe they now have newer ones, I don't know. But at least uh, one of the latest generation of GPUs. There is a fairly large FPGA with 100G interface straight into the FPGA fabric. And then, of course, there is a multi-core, I think, dual CPU, right? Dual CPU with six cores? 12 cores. Okay, so 24 cores, right? <clears throat> And so you essentially think of it as every large node has four of these, and then in the core there is a rack of these machines, right? And everything is connected through the 100G switches. And of course, the machines are, I mean, it's fairly uh, difficult to, to utilize 100G into the PC, so we actually have two uh, 25G interfaces into each machine, right? And, a, and each FPGA gets a 100G out of the switching layer, right? So if anybody knows how to program FPGAs at 100G, you can play with the stuff. Good luck, right? Uh, it's not easy to program anything at 100 gigabits per second. But, you know, at least that's a capability. And then, as I said, uh, those RF socks, once they become available, these are actually RF uh, SDRs for the millimeter wave RF. Right? So once they become available, they'll also come at 100G into the core. Because that, that's where you start, I mean, once you start talking about bandwidths of 500 megahertz, you are potentially pushing the performance on the physical layer 200 uh, gigabits per second. So if you look at the layer two deployment, which is probably what most of you care about, unless you're doing optical stuff, right? What you essentially have is uh, from every node, there are two SDRs coming with dual 10G out in the SDN layer. And then on the other end, you have a PC which has CPU, GPU, and FPGA. And then you have various ways of getting into there, including coming straight out of the switch into the FPGA. And literally, you are free to do, by the way, these also have FPGAs in them. So if you want to change the FPGA code in the SDRs, that's perfectly okay, right? We hopefully, and I'm laughing because we failed miserably over the weekend, we hopefully have ability to recover, regardless of what you do, right? So, uh, so, so you know, I, let's pretend that it worked beautifully, right? Um, okay, so, so this is essentially, why are these slides here? I thought we, we switched, okay, so, yeah, yeah. So, so Gil is now going to start talking about the actual deployment. And I have your slide. Is this yours? Yes. yes. So this one you showed already. Yes. Mm, but why? Oh, it's okay. there. I'm, I'm looking at it. And it's, it's there. Okay. Thank you, Ivan. So, so I'll quickly go over the deployment itself. So this is a slide you've seen already. And just to get the sense again, we talk about several loud sites and some medium sites. And fiber optic, as Ivan mentioned. Hopefully I can show this. Ivan, what's going on? There's no correlation between what I 
Yeah, yeah, but I, I can't see the other one. That's the problem. Wow. Ah, this is not good. Okay. Shut down this one. Is that mine? Is that yours? No. no. <gasps> Why is it? Let me close all of them. Did I close? Yes. Okay. That's it. Much better. Okay. Okay, so again, nine loud sites, several medium sites, and fiber optic, as Ivan mentioned, to all those locations. And I'll, I'll get to it in a moment. There is also fiber going downtown to the NYU data center in 32 Avenue of America. So at the high level, this is the orbit test bed you're all familiar with. The idea is to build the next generation and to take it outside. So those of you who are not familiar with the area, this is a view from Columbia University on 120th Street looking to the north. So you see on the left the George Washington Bridge, the Hudson River, and basically the deployment area is between 120 and 135. 135 is more or less where the subway gets back into the tunnel. So this is north of the Columbia campus, but as we'll see in a map in a few minutes, there are several buildings that are Columbia buildings, mostly residential buildings, that are actually north of the campus. Two other components here are the new campus that Columbia is building at around 125th Street. This is the Manhattanville campus. So that's one of the first buildings out there, but there are some old buildings like the CYT building up there also. And on the other side, we have City College of New York, CCNY, which is a neighboring university, a city university, which is located here. You see some modern looking buildings up there. So that's, I would say, the corners of the testbed, the three corners of the testbed. And in between, there are several potential city assets that we can use. So this gives you the map of the deployment plan at, I would say, the end of the day or the vision that we have. And you can see all kinds of colors here. This is Manhattan sideways. So north is over there, uptown is over there, downtown is over there, the Hudson River is up there. Those of you who are familiar with the area, this is the Riverside Church, and again, this is the Manhattan Hill Campus. So looking at that area, this is Broadway, and that is Amsterdam. You see all kinds of fibers that are in the ground, and we are in discussions with all kinds of providers about using those fibers, but also you see dots on the map, and the dots on the map represent potential locations of nodes. Right now, the demos and everything focus on the pilot. The pilot is one large node at the corner of 120th Street in Amsterdam. So that's the Columbia Engineering Building. Two medium nodes, one on 120th Street and one on Amsterdam, and I'll show pictures in a moment. And the control center, which is the base in the computer science data center, basically. And then fiber that goes downtown. Now, the colors represent different universities or entities, so yellow are potential Columbia buildings, mostly residential buildings or buildings in the Manhattanville campus. This light blue or cyan are some buildings that City College identified along with security guard booths, so that's the northeast part of the testbed. And in the middle, we have been in all kinds of discussions with different city agencies. Josh is here from the city office about potential locations. So the easiest ones are, of course, light poles. There are light poles along the streets. These are not specific light poles. These are just <coughs> potential locations of light poles that, to which Crown Castle, for example, can bring fiber. And then there are two other type of city assets. NYCHA is New York City Housing Authority. They have many buildings in this area. These are all the orange nodes. And from our deployment point of view, it doesn't really matter if it's a light pole on the street or a light pole in the courtyard over there, it's the same thing. So if we can use some of the fiber that Verizon, for example, has into the NYCHA building, that would be very helpful. So that's the, the second type of city asset. And the last type is public schools. There are about 10 public schools in the area. About four of them are actually affiliated with Columbia or Teachers College or City College. And we have an education and outreach program that will be discussed later and some demos will be shown. And we are trying to see that this will be beneficial also to the schools so they can run experiments in their school courtyard using one of our medium or small nodes. So that's 
the plan. Right now we are down here. To see it in a more illustrative way, right now we are at the pilot phase. The pilot phase includes one large node and two medium nodes. Large node, as Ivan mentioned, is antennas plus three sectors on a rooftop and some compute. <coughs> then we have compute at the data center at Columbia and we have fiber, all those are fibers, so we have also fiber going downtown to the NYU data center and coming back. That fiber was actually provided by Zenfi and allocated to us by the city. And if Jack just Jack just left, but this was an eager project that was funded by the NSF. So just to visually get a sense of what we are talking about, one large, two medium, and a few small nodes, and I'll go through all of them. So that's the large. The large is on the top of the mud building again at 120 in Amsterdam. There are three sectors more or less in those directions. As you can see, this is the 14th level of mud. This is the 16th level of mud. And actually, in order to get to the 18th level, a lot of scaffolding had to go up. So we became civil engineers in the process. Uh, but eventually, you know, it's mostly Columbia facilities doing the work, but it's interesting type of work. And you can see the antennas, the antennas up here. These are the antennas that Ivan mentioned. You can see one example hanging up there. And these are the actual boxes of, of the large nodes that were uh, deployed there by Jake and Mike. So you could see two layers here. The lowest layer, or the internal layer, are the SDRs. And then on top of that, there is another layer with the power amplifiers, the chassis manager, and so on. And of course, some fiber that eventually go down to the data center. So eventually, I think from up there to the data centers, we have 12 pairs of fiber. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. 12, right? 12 pairs of fiber going from the rooftop down to the data center. So, so that's, uh, that's the large node. That's the medium node. So the medium node, we have two of those. One is facing Amsterdam. One is facing 120 Street. These are, this is basically the node. You can see that the antennas are omnidirectional, and below there is actually a camera looking at the intersection. Zoran will talk about the camera and some potential smart intersection experiments in a moment. So this is the outside part, and this is the internal part. Again, the internal of the box is very similar to one sector of the large node. And I think you can see up here. So internally it looks the same, it's a little bit more condensed just because of the size we can place in those locations. But it has all the components, then it has fiber, and from here I believe we again have 12 pairs going back to the data center. Uh, six, six, sorry. Six pairs, 12 fibers, right? Yeah. Uh, these are the ones that are activated. I think we have more there, but that's right. OK. Uh, Again, this was a challenging endeavor. You can see Zoran actually here with a hard hat. We learned that we cannot take pictures without hard hats. So <laughs> this is mostly for the picture. Uh, but uh, actually, you know, Zoran had to go up there and to make sure that the camera is actually looking at the intersection. So, so that's, that's a medium node. The optical part is here. So there is a lot of fiber going to all those locations. And uh, this, we actually now post stuff on Twitter, because we learned that's the only way to convey that that stuff is being, uh, stuff is happening. So we posted this and we wrote uh, four letters for 5G or something. So somebody responded, you see 5G, I see three OSA violations. So you should not <laughs> post stuff like that. <laughs> but for here, no, no record. Ah, there is a recording. Don't post it. You <laughs> deny, you said. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, anyway, but a lot of fiber has been deployed. Uh, the idea, again, you'll see the, f the, the optical demo in a moment, but the idea is that eventually you want to get to all those locations with fiber and to provide experimenters a lot of flexibility in the way they run their experiment and the topologies that they create. So they can emulate the topology of operator number one or topology of operator number two. And for that, you actually have to have a lot of fiber to all those locations. So there will be a discussion of, on that, but when they will be discussing, you know, the optical rack, they also have some computing, that's more or less it, and you'll see more pictures of it in a moment. 
One more fiber component, as I mentioned, the city along with Zenfi gave us fiber that goes downtown. Downtown is 32 Avenue of America. This is a co-location site, and this is also the NYU data center. So once we have more servers, we can also place them down there. And you can think about all kinds of edge cloud applications where you either do your compute at the node itself, or you push it to the CS data center in Colombia, or you push it downtown. And of course, the delays and the performance would change, but this depends on you know, what is the reaction that you need from your system. So we have two pairs of fibers going downtown. Actually, a real truck came in, the manhole was open, real stuff happens. So, so that's, that's more or less that. And I think, Ivan, now we go to your slides, and then we go back to the output. Uh, so, so honestly, I'm hoping that 3.7 to 4.2 will be the most interesting one. Because it's somewhat, <coughs> I, I don't think anyone would see what another will do something there other than whether data drives, which is highly unlikely that there is a I don't know. We'll see. Maybe there is a weather station in Carl and Python. Right, so, so you know. Um, OK, so now um, we're going to switch a little bit to how do you actually use the test bed, right? And I, I will, I mean, I have to admit, the slides are, you can't believe it, the slides are 10 years old. The slides that you're about to see are 10 years old because we are using Orbit, in, Orbit software and Orbit platform literally to, to run it on Cosmos. And so I, I had the giggle this morning when I, when I was sort of selecting slides. There are way too many of them, so I'm going to breeze through most of them, OK? A anyway, it's, it's way more um, interesting to do this on your own, meaning hands-on, than me talking about it. It doesn't make, doesn't make much, much sense, but nevertheless. So the first thing, how do you access the testbed? So remember, in pilot, we have two things. One is the actual pilot deployment, meaning those three nodes, one large and two mediums, right? We also have a sandbox. Sandbox is actually something that's not supposed to radiate anything, meaning we do have antennas attached to devices, but they're not meant to be used for any useful experiments. It's really meant as a place where you would go and develop your code, which essentially means that you have one of each device that is available in the testbed attached to a modest computing uh, so that you can start developing your own stuff, right? And Assumption is that it's much easier to get access to the sandbox. Hopefully, we'll have a few of those readily available later on. Right now, we have one sandbox and one pilot deployment, right? But we can replicate sandboxes as many times as we need to do and provide platform for code development for people who don't have their own uh, radius <clears throat> or, or infrastructure. Now, both of those, meaning both Sand, uh, sandbox and what we call the test bed, right, meaning the main Cosmos deployment, are accessed through the console. So there is a PC that's facing outwards that you use to access the uh, domain, right? There are two consoles, therefore, one for sandbox, one for test bed. The access is SSH based. If you don't know what SSH is, you have to do some homework, right? Um, it's even though we can probably do things and we will do be doing things and the whole community is trying to come up with the tools that are uh, facilitating ease of use, um, it's still a command line interface, okay? Which means you have to type things, write scripts, do stuff. Um, there are some ideas and there are some facilities that we have that we'll probably be releasing in the near future that will enable graphical something, I don't know what. But it's really um, important that people who want to play with the testbed know something about Linux and understand what SSH is, know basic commands, and you know, have some ideas about how to script or orchestrate their experiments. Right? <clears throat> Now, I, I already said that, and I'm, I'm, even though everybody is talking about virtualization and all that stuff, I'm, I'm sort of like, no, 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 one person at a time. So right now, at the moment, you reserve the testbed resource. That means 
sandbox or the textual testbed, one person at a time. And you use the scheduler, which is shown here. Right? So if you really think about it, this shows orbit scheduler. It's the same for, for, for Cosmos, right? So each domain is a horizontal line. There is a 24-hour period. You go in and you say, I take it from 8 to 12, right? And the whole hardware is yours to do anything you want, right? So that's the idea. Now, of course, if I, if I give you some remote PC somewhere that's empty, meaning has nothing on it, of course, you would say, well, what, what can I do with it? So you, yes, we have ways of you handling it. But the first step really is just to go and make a reservation. Now, there are all sorts of fancy colors. I'm not going to go into details. But other than to say, by the way, this is 2013 snapshot. So um, <clears throat> you can actually see that uh, color, this particular color means that you're in this slot right now. Yellow means these slots are not yet confirmed. People reserved it, but there was no confirmation that they will get it. And of course, that implies that multiple people can ask for the same slot, right? And um, there is a mechanism that we go through all the time, uh, which is auto-approver, that sort of resolves these conflicts, right? And the idea is to try to sort of prevent people from hogging the resources, right? So if two people ask for the same slot, just-in-time approval will happen for the person who used the testbed least in the last three weeks, right? <clears throat> now, one thing to remember is whenever there is a major conference, then it's, you know, we don't answer phones. <laughs> so don't try to call and say how you have a really important deadline. It doesn't work. <laughs> Same applies if you're teaching a course and your students are not serious and they wait for the last minute. Actually, that happened last week. Somebody complained how they have a really important <laughs> assignment to finish for the deadline. You know, we can't help you. It's a machine deciding who gets the slot, right? <clears throat> uh, similar to that, there is a status page, which sort of, of course, this again is the orbit. And by the way, it's never, this doesn't exist anymore. There's no more 400 nodes. It's much less, right? So it sort of shows, and there is a page on Cosmos that's similar to this. Um, this shows all the devices and all the nodes that we have in the, in the uh, testbed, and it shows the state of the node. And in this case, right, there are two nodes that are turned on, 394 are turned off, and two are in some sort of dead state, right? Similarly, you have um, ability to sort of look for certain types of devices. So we have some filters, um, which actually I don't think in Cosmos that works yet. Maybe, I don't know. But you know, it gives you the ability to find, let's say you are looking for an N310, which is a type of USRP, the SDR, monitoring SDR. It will tell you, if you, if you choose one of these, it will tell you which nodes have it, right? So that you can then decide what you want to use and reserve. And uh, the reason why I was laughing about the, the slides is that now you would, you would, you're supposed to SSH into the testbed and do your first experiment, right? We'll create the reservation, do all that stuff. So we're going to skip that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you know, this is the testbed, right? So remember, once you're on the console, you actually have access to everything if you know how to do it. So if you know how to turn on the node, you can do it. If you know how to create a TFTP link to network boot the node, you can do it. Of course, most of you don't, right? You don't know what is the mechanism for turning the node on. It's sitting in some documentation somewhere on the website, right? But it's, it's going to take you forever to discover that. So in order to simplify that, we created something that's called the Orbit Management Framework, which is actually a set of tools that allows you to efficiently work with the, with the testbed, right? That doesn't mean that you have to use it. As I said, you can do it all manually if you know what you're doing, right? But it's not easy. <clears throat> it has two purposes. One is to sort of support the experiment cycle, right? Meaning do all the stuff that we think you really are trying to do. But then also it's supposed to help you to manage the testbed, right? 
And so, um, just to illustrate what I'm talking about, here is the workflow, right? The idea is, and this is now an experimental workflow the way we see it, or this is a view from a few years back, more like 12 years back. You sort of describe your experiment in some, some way, right? And you will see the way that we think is efficient to do it. But you know, assumption is that you have some sort of a script that describes what you're trying to do. And this can be a, a, a you know, parallel SSH list of instructions that will, or each machine will execute. You put that into framework, in this case, orbit management framework, but you put into some sort of framework that will allow you to execute this on multiple machines, right? You, at the same time, want to collect a lot of results, measurements. So, you know, you have to come up with a way of receiving information. And just think about this. If you have small number of machines, like in this case, let's say, three, or three Cosmos nodes, it's probably easy. You can say, oh, I'm going to store it on the local file system, and then at the end of experiment, I'll, I'm going to fetch that out. In orbit, you had 400 nodes. I want to see who can SSH in 400 nodes in two hours time slot and copy files. Right? That wouldn't be a very uh, rewarding experience. Right? And then, of course, uh, assumption is that you know, eventually you loop through this running the experiments. So, um, I'm, I'm breezing a little bit through it. This is actually how it looks like in the test. You have the experiment controller. This is a piece of software running on the console, right? And this is actually the orchestrator that talks to each of the nodes as you're executing your experiment. Then you have a bunch of services sitting in the testbed that are making things happen. So in other words, when you say turn the node on through the experiment controller. What actually happens is the experiment controller talks to a service, a particular service, and says, hey, turn such and such device on. That, in turn, somehow, magically, talks to that CM box that, that Gil was showing on the, on the corner of the testbed, which literally flips the switch on the power supply of the device, right? And the thing magically turns on. So, of course, as you can imagine, there is a fairly large number of services, not just for turning nodes on and off, but doing all sorts of stuff related to this. And then, most importantly, on the nodes themselves, if you choose so, there are components that correspond to the experiment controller, which are called resource controller, right? And the idea there is, of course, that whatever commands the, the experiment controller issues, somebody better receive them and, and act on them. There is another component in all of this, which is called the OML, which stands for Orbit Measurement Library, which is a piece of software that enables you to efficiently emit and collect measurements uh, as your experiment is run. OMF commands, oops, sorry, that was too fast. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, obviously help, I mean, that's, that's uh, just going to print you essentially this output. Exact is for you to execute the experiment script. I'm not going to spend any time on this. These are interesting. OMF load, OMF say, OMF tell, and OMF stat. Start with the simplest one. OMF stat tells you the state of resource. You can see it on the status page, or you can on the console say OMF stat and ask for state of every node. Right? And it's going to tell you whether it's on or off, or not available, which is also possible. OMF tell. Is counterpart of that that allows you to turn the node on or turn the node off or reset, right? Save and load are probably the commands that you're going to use the most. As the name implies, load allows you to put arbitrary content onto the hard drive of the PC, right? So, most probably everybody is going to start their experiment with loading what we call the baseline image, which is. In this case, I believe Ubuntu 18.04 right now with nothing else on it. It has SSH client and nothing else, right? I think maybe it has NTP to time synchronize and stuff like that. But it's a basic vanilla operating system. Once you put it on, right, you can then turn the node on, SSH into it, and do whatever you want. If you want to install Windows, be my guest. You just have to figure out licensing with Microsoft, right? 
I mean, we don't have any Windows licenses to give you, but there are no issues. I mean, you can put arbitrary operating system, NetBSD, OpenBSD, whatever, whatever you want. In other words, this command allows you to put arbitrary disk content onto a hard drive. You can put a, a empty hard drive on it if you really want to, I mean, all zeros, right? Correspondingly, OMF save allows you to save whatever you have on that image, on that node, onto the image. And in other words, the cycle goes in, you load the baseline, you add to it whatever you want, install whatever software you want, compile, do all the necessary motions, and then you save your image for the next time. Or you save your image so you can spread it across the multiple nodes in the test, book, right? Load allows you to put uh, image on as many machines on the testbed as you want in a single shot, whereas save only saves one node at a time, okay? Um, <clears throat> in the interest of time, and I'm looking at the wrong clock, but um, I'm not going to spend too much time on exec, uh, and the reason why is because um, there is a, so, so uh, I have want to talk a little bit more about orbit measurement library. But in order to really talk about experiment execution, we have to go deep into how uh, Orbit experimental development language works. So I'm not going to, uh, we don't have enough time for that. So again, you're now supposed to pretend that you did your basic commands and don't know how to wor work with a test bed. Orbit measurement library, right? Jumping through the intro slide, the whole idea is that you have a server and you have clients emitting measurements, right? We spend a lot of time optimizing that process and trying to make sure that you can collect large number of measurements simultaneously from fairly large number of nodes. As the uh, slide implies, it's a push-based architecture, which means that each node emits measurements and the server receives them, stores them in the database. There are two databases that we support at the moment. One is the SQLite, which is essentially a single file. The main reason why that's interesting is because at the end of your experiment, you copy that one file to your home directory, and you're good to go, right? The second one, of course, is PostgreSQL, which is a much bigger uh, professional database. The idea is if you're collecting really, really large data sets, um, you want to make sure that you have scalability there, right? So those are the two basic backend databases that OML supports at the moment. By the way, all the software, is open source and, and sitting somewhere on the GitHub, right? So if you just search for it, you will be able to find it. <clears throat> just to illustrate how it looks like, right? So you have your application or service. It has certain measurement points. It pushes it through the series of filters or streams, which again are available. There is a OML server on the other end and a database that sits behind it. And it stores it there and you can get it. Now, all sorts of combinations are possible. You know, multiple nodes sending to a single database, multiple databases, fairly versatile. And um, uh, the application that exists and that support OML, there are quite a few of those. Of course, most of the ones that people are interested in are things like OTG, iPerf, right? All the stuff that people normally use to evaluate performance of the network. When I say there, Supported, that means that we have the OMLized iPerf. If you run our version of iPerf, your results are going to go into the database at the end of your experiment, right? <clears throat> um, as I said, lots of different things, right? And there are also some built in filters which allow you to sort of uh, do filtering of measurements if you're collecting really, really massive amounts of data. You want to uh, prune the measurements at the source. Right? In, in other words, if you have a very large number of nodes, it's highly likely that you will um, run out of uh, network bandwidth. Um, I'm going to skip all of this, uh, mainly in the interest of saving time. So this is talking about how you program the experiments. I think it's really not, it's way more important for you guys to see the experiments rather than, or demos rather than try to understand all of this stuff. Um, especially the Hello World virus. So this is where I will stop, and Gil will continue with the outreach, I believe. Um, important stuff are these websites, right? So it's more or less everything is somewhere down there, okay? 
And as I said, if you're coming to the Medif workshop next week in DC, there will be hands-on on all of this, and all the slides that I breeze through uh, will be displaying the detail. So then Panayotis and then Okay. Uh, no, so outreach. I mean, who's next? So uh, it's the same set of slides that I just showed. It is? Um, do we know which one that was deployment, right? No. Is that it? Yes, yes, yes. This one. This one. Here. Yeah. And then after that, it's Mike and Jake. Yeah. No, after that, it's... Uh, don't, don't go away. You need yeah. to start the video in a moment. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So, so before we go into the details of the testbed, we, we take one D2. And, you know, there is a big component here of education and outreach. And I think most of the discussion will be by Panayotis, but just to give a high level. So there are two components. One is by Silicon Harlem. Bruce was here. I think he left or is around. And the other one is a program that we organized last summer and we will organize also in the incoming and uh, upcoming summer focusing on middle school and high school teachers. So we had 10 middle school and high school teachers during the past summer. Each of them got a stipend. They participated in a two, three week learning session in NYU. And then they went on and developed a set of experiments that they took back to their schools. So they took to their schools a $2,000 worth of a, what call it a mini Cosmos test bed that they can use for experimentation. And they have been running those experiments in their schools throughout the year. We are actually now recruiting teachers for the upcoming summer. We have several applications and we are now going through them. So I'll go through, instead of going through many slides, I'll show a quick video and then Panayotis will actually show the hands-on aspect. Just hide it. Okay. And then you have to go on the left. Or let's see if this works. If this works, I, I don't know. Right voice. And one of the really exciting parts of it is that there's a live test bed here in West Harlem. So Cosmos uh, ran a research experience for teachers this summer, working with us to develop educational toolkits related to wireless technology. Essentially, what I wanted to do was delve specifically into the heat island effect. We've identified three data collection sites. We want to really learn about how to transmit data from sensors. We're actually bringing what's possible to the rock. They're actually going to be able to utilize not only this kind of technology to do legitimate scientific study, but it also empowers students. It gives them agency. The Cosmos Education Toolkit is a downstream version of the Cosmos testbed that we build in uh, Harlem. Uh, so the same uh, hardware is, uh, that uh, we use in order to evaluate the next generation of wireless technologies, we use to allow the students to execute real experiments and understand the wireless technologies and how they work in the real environment. It's challenging to bring authentic hands-on science and math lessons into the classroom. The Cosmos Toolkit really allows for a research lab to come into the classroom so that students can conduct experiments using the toolkit. Last week, I started talking about uh, signal strength. I gave them a little background what the signal is. Oh, they were asking, like, really, Mustafa? I mean, this, uh, this way, this signal is traveling here? And I said, yes, it is. It does. The kids got so, like, you know, curious about it. And when they conduct the actual experiment, they were so happy. They never had the knowledge that, you know, when you communicate, they can actually see the real, the real signal strength as a wave on the screen. I ask them a lot about what their inspiration is and like how they use that um, to come up with innovative solutions for whatever challenge I put in front of them. And I say, write down every question you have. Okay, pick two. Turn them into a testable question. How can you research this? Um, so just turning their curiosities, they're so much more invested than the questions come from them. The contents of it just lines up perfectly with a complete unit that I had to teach, which involves waves. Showing them graphics like this brings them into a whole new world. As we move forward, we want other teachers to participate in our program. We are already recruiting teachers for the next round. But more importantly, kids throughout New York City should be able to log in onto the testbed and run experiments locally in our testbed. Initially, the teachers had a lot of questions and they struggled. 
But after a while, you know, the researchers did such a great job and they had such great patience and supporting them in understanding the concepts and wireless technology that now they're the ones going to conferences and teaching other teachers how to do so.